Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are thrilled to welcome back one of our faves, Jack, I like to call him Nacho Alato. Nacho comes from Ignatius, Ignatius Alato, one of our absolute all-time greats, one of the big minds at Fundraising Academy. And Jack, I'm gonna brag on you a little bit because in the green room chatter, we were talking about you going to Newfoundland to work with a team uh, there from the Ronald McDonald House to help them with their fundraising strategies. You're going on that that trek very shortly. Um, but more importantly, and I think maybe more interestingly enough to me, you run one of the premier CFRE training groups or approaches. Um, how many are in your your current class or your last class these yeah. numbers just keep getting huge well the last class had 174 and the first class of the this year started in january had about about the sim, same number so they were pretty high the next class would start which starts july 13th already has 57 people so and and there are some repeats and i i'm happy that people take it more than once um and it's free it's free it's amazing. And then you, um, along with Muhi, are going to, Kawaja, are going to be doing one specifically for Muslim affiliated, Muslim related yep. nonprofits as well, right? And is and that, we're, yeah, we're doing that on Wednesdays right now. And that's going to wind down sometime in early June. And that's, that's great fun because, the, you know, speaking of Canada, a lot of Canadians in that group as well from Toronto mm -hmm. and other places in yeah. Canada. So that's exciting. That's wonderful. Well, you are a treasure and we are just delighted to have you here for Friday Ask and Answer. I want to briefly uh, let everyone know, and it's been a really fun time for us here on the Nonprofit Show. We've been debuting our new co-host panel. They come from all over the country. They do all different things. They have different ideas. It has been so exciting. So um you'll get to be learning more about them and meeting them as we journey forward because um wow what an incredible group of people we also have another incredible group of people that support us and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy nonprofit thought leader staffing boutique your part-time controller 180 management group fundraising academy at national university where jack comes to us from jmt consulting and nonprofit tech talk these are the folks that really um, have pretty much been with us since the beginning and share a passion for supporting the nonprofit sector. Okay, my friend, we have some very interesting questions this week that are so different. Um, I took this person's name off because sometimes um, I do that when I think maybe a community is small or they could be identified and, and I don't wanna you know, cause any issue. So this comes to us from Reno. And so they wrote in, so this is odd. I just had a donor who I have worked with for years tell me that they are considering working with another nonprofit who is a competitor. This donor wants me to pitch him on why our nonprofit should win his donation and not the other. I'm yeah. uncomfortable and a bit shaken by this. Yeah, I would be I would be shaken by it as well. You know, one of the things that we we have talked about, Julia, in the AFP Code of Ethics, is that we do not disparage other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the tenets of the AFP Code of Ethics, and so I am reluctant to engage in a conf conversation which would disparage another nonprofit. Not that this is something this person would do but i'll tell you what they've been working with them for years as they say in the question they should have a really strong relationship with that donor and for me i you know i would just continue to talk about the benefits of giving to my organization the importance of making a gift to advance the mission of our organization and it's okay if they also want to give to another organization doing similar work. It just mm -hmm. makes the whole community much better in trying to solve whatever that issue is that both of these organizations are dealing with. But I would, I don't, you know, it's a tough question it for is. me to answer. Yeah. It is. And, so, 
we had Mike Geiger on on Wednesday, uh, CEO and president of uh, AFP Association of Fundraising Professionals. Um, he's a fascinating guy. We've had him yeah. on before during Icon, but just to have him on the show for thirty minutes, you know, it was it was riveting. Not a lot of people, not a lot of no donors know this code of ethics. Would this be an appropriate time to say, you know, we we work with this code of ethics that our yeah. governing organization, 30,000 members, you know, right. subscribes to? Yeah. I mean, do we do that to try and educate them? Or I, so Listen, I, I am a proponent. I, you know, you, you know, Julia. Angela Barnes and I have been on with you talking about a donor code of ethics. Yeah. But here's the thing about the AFP code of ethics. If your organization has a welcome packet for new donors or continuing donors, I would put that code of ethics in that donor packet. Let them have that. And so that when you come up with an issue where a donor is saying, I'm going to choose between you and this organization, Tell me why I should choose you over them. Then you can say, well, you know, I, I, I want to be really careful, Mr. Donor, Miss Donor, Mrs. Donor, but I am not going to enter a competitive dialogue about another nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. I'm, I just wouldn't do it. And, you know, sometimes, look, guys, we, we live in an industry where it's so uh, revenue, you know, dependent. Yeah. Sometimes we have to let donors go. Yeah. And I think I think we'll talk about that again when as we progress through some of these questions today. You know, it, it seems to when I read this question, um, my first thought was this donor is probably an entrepreneur, somebody in sales, because that's their mentality. And yeah. I'm not negating them by any stretch right. of imaginations imagination and i probably don't think that they think are they approaching or using this framework as something negative they probably see competition as a healthy thing might have helped them build their business i mean all these different things and so um trying to understand what where this comes from yeah from that donor's point of view yeah. i think could be a little bit healthier of a thing for everybody because yeah i agree with you it would be a little shocking to have that you know it's like you're being put in the pit yeah exactly uh well this the, the i know there's a remake of the movie you know uh where these two people two men go in one man comes out kind of thing. I, you know, I can't remember the movie but it's a place in australia but you know yeah i'm gonna do that i mean i'm past the, those days if you believe in the mission of both organizations and you want to advance both organizations' mission, then give to both. Right. Give to both organizations. It's not one against the other. It would be like saying Catholic charity against Jewish community and family services yeah. or Lutheran services against the other two. Sorry, we're, this is a big community. We're all doing similar work and all of these organizations are new. Right. Right. I think you're right. And I, I agree with you. Um, and I, I think there's a way to um, communicate that and educate at the same time. And okay. and maybe you lose the whole relationship. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Well, good luck on that one. Hey, let's go to our next question. It comes to, for, from New York City from Joseph. And Joseph writes, as a professional fundraiser, I feel that the board of directors don't understand what we actually do. How can I get in front of them to educate and challenge your views? They think our team just dials for dollars and they have actually used those words. This is not the first time we've heard this. No, no. And you know what this is, it's a failure of a culture of philanthropy. Okay. And, and it's easy to understand how, how that we fail at a culture of philanthropy. And it's this, I think every board member Every board meeting should start with a review of the mission, the why the organization uh, exists. And every board meeting must con contain in it some report by the development professionals that talks about the successes and the challenges. Let's not forget the challenges of, of how we do our work 
what we do and et cetera, you know, how we get that annual campaign going. What is a major gift campaign and what does it mean? But most importantly, the why of a culture of philanthropy, what the role of every single person in the organization is in advancing the mission the important role that we all play. It's not dialing for dollars. If it were dialing for dollars, probably we would need many less fundraisers because that seems much easier than what we actually do, which is building those relationships, which yeah. takes time. Yeah. It's not that easy. No. You know, Jack, you said something really interesting about having that development director in the room during those meetings. And when I think back, Across the trajectory of my board service, I can only think of maybe two organizations that had that development director there for the board meetings, and which is shameful. Yeah. Shameful. Yeah. I mean, so that what do you think, or what have you oh, seen? Listen, I took it. I I accepted a job, and then when I found out I would not have access to the board, I called up and said I can't accept a job where I don't have access to the board. Okay. The development professionals must be at the leadership table, whether it's internal with staff, with the CEO or the executive director, the head of HR, maybe the CFO, de development people must be at that table and they must be at the board table when the board meets. You know, money fuels mission. That's the, the whole thing. So let's talk about money and how we get that money what our work is and how they need to be involved in. Mm -hmm. You know, I say this and I've said it before, it's not my quote, but I don't know who said it, but the board's role in fundraising is inescapable. Mm -hmm. So you have to be at the table talking to them about what fundraising is and how it goes about and their role in it. Yeah. You know, Joseph, it sounds to me like you don't have a, a seat at the table or, a, or an opportunity to be talking. And um, that, wow, Jack, th this is really an important thing that we need to keep revisiting and re and supporting because, you know, it's heartbreaking to think that somebody does all this work and then, you know, building their relationships, really invested in that cause selling cycle and, and really educating themselves and motivating their teams and then at the end of the day, when they go before or the, the group, the leadership of the organization, the board, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have that understanding. It's, it's I, like I said, it's kind of heartbreaking. It is. It is wow. heartbreaking. Okay. Well, Joseph, good luck. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is really funny because this came up with um, your, you made this comment. And so, this is fascinating. A development team from Dallas, Texas writes in, how do you feel about putting AFP donor code of ethics in our donor perspectives? Our development team is divided on this and we could use some feedback. I mean, you kind of pre-answered the question with the first yeah. one. Well, you know, our donor perspectives, I love that. I, you know, I'd love to see a copy of that. Send it to me. That looks interesting. Uh, I've never heard it framed that way, but I think I, where you put your, where you would put the AFP code of ethics uh, for fundraisers or standard of behavior, or in, if you're in healthcare, they have one, or a donor code of ethics is in the welcome pack, yeah. in that welcome pack. And, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a welcome packet, you know, but I love welcome packets because it just furthers the relationship. It keeps them involved after that first gift. They send you that first gift, no matter what the gift is, and you send them this donor code of ethics. Um, and, and it says, here are certain ways that we expect our donors to behave. Here are certain ways that we will behave towards you. Yeah. And here are certain things that our organization believes in, our mission, our vision, our values, and how we attempt to advance those. So all of that is such a beautiful way to welcome a donor into your organization for the first time. And then you know, look at it maybe a year or two later, you may send it out again, say, hey, thank you for being a loyal donor. Just to remind you, here is some information about our organization, what we went going for. One of the things that I love about annual reports, 
which could go into that. And when I look at a website and I read an annual report and it just has all success on it, oh, we did this and we did this and we did this. I want to see the challenges. If you do not have challenges, why should anyone support you? You're already success. You don't need my new money to come into your organization. I want to see the challenges. You know, who was not served by your organization? What animals were not collected and brought to your animal shelter? What, what didn't you accomplish? Because you know what? I firmly believe this, Julia, and let me tell me if I'm wrong. Donors want to give to your future, not to your past. Yeah. So again, that yeah. donor code of ethics could be in your annual report. Publish it on your website. Put it in a variety of eight places. Here are the things that we accept from our donors. You know, I love that attitude for a lot of reasons, um, because I think that we have to educate donors on how to work effectively um, so that we meet expectations, right? And they're happy and we're happy. And, and they, they it it's not just for our organization, it's for our entire culture and our ecosystem, right? Um, you know, so many times you have given us answers or ideas that will benefit the person asking the question. But when you really step back, you have to realize that they will benefit many other nonprofits, right? Because then, then they'll go back out to different organizations that they support and they'll be elevated to to that's right. be a better steward. So, I mean, that that's a huge opportunity. But um, one of the things that I like about your comment, Jack, is that I feel like it helps to elevate the entire sector as a profession. Because right. I think a lot of people are like, oh, you're so, bless your heart, you work in the nonprofit sector. You know, you just must have a heart of gold, you know, versus like, wow, that's a professional, well-admired, well-compensated, yeah. educated yeah. profession, right? Right. And Yeah, I think, I think sometimes the public has a perception of us, not as professionals, but people who are caring. We're yeah. charity people, you yeah. know. We're yeah. charity people, you know, and we just want to do good and all this. And so don't give us enough money to survive or to feed our family. You know, don't give us enough money to buy a house. We don't we don't really need those things. We're like we're like, uh, you know, like the clergy who take vows right. of poverty. Not me. OK, yeah. <laughs> not not Jack. So, you know, what? pay pay people what they deserve, you know, <laughs> and, you know, it's 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 just important. You know, it's funny because uh, Mike Geiger mentioned that, uh, again, CEO and president of AFP, uh, when he was on last week, um, I asked him about the bleed off that we've had for the last decade of nonprofit um, fundraisers not being able to stay within organizations past like an average of 18 months. And he said that they have a new report that just came out, just came out saying that um, the trajectory looks like it's shifting that people are being paid more and yeah. that 75% of those that they surveyed um, said that they plan on staying with their organization this year and not yeah. being part of that cycle of change um, and reporting that they're, you know, seeing more inroads and that they're happier and that, you know, they're able to navigate their job and their mission that they love. And yeah. so for me, that was just huge because to me, that has been such a black mark on our, our sector and right. it, it it dovetails to so many things, like the things that you've talked about with the donor code of ethics, with the funder code of ethics, with, you know, just professionalism. Um, those types of things get eroded very quickly and we disengage when that happens. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. You know, which then nobody wins. I mean, everybody loses when, you know, um, that happens. Okay, well, I'm going to get off the soapbox and I'm going to move on to, <laughs> well, this means something to me. So I get all riled up, Jack. Okay, another name withheld, Cincinnati, Ohio. Do you think a successful philanthropic office officer can work part-time? We want to expand the team, but can only afford a, a part-time employee. We could really use some help on this and maybe a different strategy. Yeah, I'm okay with hiring people part time. Like, you uh, are. Uh, yeah, I, but here's the thing every part time job I ever had 
was really a full-time job. Yeah. So, uh, so we have to be careful that we're not thinking, well, you're going to work part-time, we're going to pay you part-time, but really we're going to need you to work full-time. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that doesn't happen. But I think, I think, you know, if you give staff, whether it's full-time or part-time, the resources they need to be successful, like time, money, meaning a budget for what you want them to do in this part-time position, and you you give them those resources that they need, they'll be successful. And, you know, that's what I think employees want, whether it's full-time or part-time. So I'm not opposed to it, but look at yourselves, guys. Look at your organization and make sure you're going to provide them with the tools they need to be successful. That's really the key there, whether it's full-time or part-time. And I think I think part-time, it's it really depends on what you want them to do. If you want them, if you're saying a part-time major gift officer and you want them to have a portfolio of 200 major gift prospects, I don't think part-time is going to work for them. That's not going to work. Yeah. What would, what would you say about possibly, um, and I'm just throwing this out there, setting a goal or a limit or, you know, a budget for um, if they reach this, they can go to full-time. Now, we don't know if this is because you know, they, they think that the market will, it, it says we, we can only afford part-time, but, um, you know, and, and maybe the marketplace is also saying there's only part-time yeah. folks that want this, but where it's like, if you reach this goal that funds a full-time position or do you, do you see anything like that? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, the, the question is from the perspective of the organization. What about the perspective of the potential employee? I mean, what what would I say if I was I saw this job announcement and it's a part time, whatever the position is, philanthropic officer, or whatever? I would really say, well, what are your expectations yeah. around that part time job? What do you want me to accomplish? And how much time do I have? And like you said earlier, Julie, what's the budget for me to accomplish this goal? What are the goals? What are the tactics you are expecting me to utilize? If it's if it's an annual giving officer, do you want me to write the letter? Do you want me to go to the mail house? Do you want me to mail them? How, what, what are the expectations? Now, right. typically, a lot of that would be in a job description, but there are some other things that I would want to ferret out from this employer before I would accept the job. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you bring up some really interesting points because um, most people you know, in our sector, they are really driven by mission and they want to do right. And I can see where this quickly, you know, bleeds over into full-time work. And I'm, I mean, I, I know, like you said, Jack, you don't just turn off your mind, right? You're, you're yeah. in it and you start living it and breathing it. And so how do you mitigate that time served versus, you know, time? Yeah. Um, and also oh. the, the, it, I think you need to have a real, from the organization's point, as you just mentioned, a really firm grip on what's the expectation, because how are you going to manage a portfolio right? part-time versus full-time? That's a big, yeah. that's, that's a big difference. Is. And, you know, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, you could reach some benchmark and then you shift the full time or they love you, et cetera. And, you know, maybe this is a testing ground to see if this yeah. is the right person for this job or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But, I, you know, uh, and I look part time work works for a lot of people, you know, and so I, I don't want to disparage part time work. But let's make sure that it's really part time and let's understand clearly what the expectations are on both sides of the equation. Really you interesting. Know. Really, really interesting. Well, Jack Alato, superstar of Fundraising Academy at National University. Um, I'm going to call you a bon vivant because you're on your way to work with a group in Newfoundland. Um, in the green room chatter, you talked about that briefly. I love, love, love that you're doing this. And, um, you know, it's that 50 mile rule. Like sometimes when somebody comes and Newfoundland's a much more arduous trip than just 50 miles. But sometimes when somebody comes from another community from more than 50 miles away, <laughs> they bring a different perspective. Sure. Yeah. I think that's magical. 
And you know, Monday, we talked about this in the green room. What is that? Monday's the holiday in Canada. Yes. Talk to us about that. It's Victoria Day. You know, that woman who was queen for a long time until Elizabeth came along. And how I, every time I, you know, when you go to Canada or England or any of the, you know, the former British Commonwealth countries and you see her, she's so imposing, you know, so strong, you know. Um, And I just, I think, look, I'm going to celebrate on Monday as well. I don't know. Maybe there's a traditional drink you have to drink for Victoria Day. Maybe it might be what? What is the whiskey? Uh, whis- uh, you know, Canadian Club whiskey or whatever. I'll drink that. You know, it should be tea. <laughs> tea, of course. I'm sure she had tea. Tea and a high tea. You know, I'll high put tea. a jacket and tie on. I haven't worn for years, and I'll have a high tea with little uh, finger sandwiches. And, oh. Oh, that sounds perfect. I love it. We should really get back to some of those traditions. I love it. Well, you know, I bet that they have high tea for some of their donors when they meet for, you know, meetings. That sounds ideal. Uh, It sounds like a. I took my niece once for a high tea and she was like, what's this all about? I said, we're going to drink tea, honey, and we're going to have some little finger sandwiches. Those little cucumber sandwiches, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, those are the best. Those are the best. Well, you know, um, you'll have to come back and share with us at some point um, some of those differences and some of the similarities. I mean, our friends to the north and the nonprofit space, they're so engaged. Um, I know that so many there's so many crossover organizations. There's so many crossover um, opportunities for education and and leadership and all that. But at the end of the day, we are different nations with different sets of rules. And and it would be Mm -hmm. really interesting to find out, you know, the Ronald McDonald House. I hope you don't mind me disclosing that that's who you're going to be with. But, um, you know, that was an American based organization. And when they when they work there, how how does that differ? Right. Um, I know that uh, the Wendy's uh, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, they are also in Canada but right. they have a different color logo and they have different red uh yeah. you know regulations that they have to follow uh the yeah. missions are the same the missions yeah. are the same but you know you know interesting you mentioned afp do you know the chapter uh, of afp in st john's is the chapter for two provinces labrador and newfoundland so one chapter two gigantic masses of land so it's exciting. I'm excited to go there. And I'm excited to see a couple of those people are, were in study groups of mine. I'm excited to see them and, and meet them and just see what they're doing. Well, you know what, Jack? I say this to you all the time, but thank you, thank you, thank you for your service to our sector. Thank you for you know being bold and reaching out um, and really doing something that is forward thinking for us all. Um, I'm going to put a plug in to you, for you, my friend. You are looking for an opportunity at the South Pole. And there are a yes. lot of- I want to go to the South Pole. Yeah, there are a lot of research organizations that could use your help. Yes, definitely. I went to the North Pole in 2016. It's time to go to the South Pole, right? I'm ready. I love it. Well, please reach out to Jack Alato. He's got, we got to get him down there. <laughs> for a cause selling educational opportunity because that's right talk about having to raise money in a tough situation <laughs> that's a tough situation my friend oh totally <laughs> no it there well no hey high. jack galato travel safe my friend can't wait to hear about your trip and the folks that you meet and more importantly the folks that you help so thank you you know, Thank everybody, you. as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we leave with this message. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. <laughs> <laughs>